Right, so here is the 2023 Trends episode of Architect Tomorrow. So if you've not seen our short uh, recap of 2022, uh, do go and check that out for introductions to the panel. Uh, we're going to get stuck into 2023 predictions. I think the first one, given it's really, really topical, is AI, and specifically large language models like uh, GPT, uh, the open AI, and it's creating a lot of headlines right now, so it's very topical, but I think... Um, for me, there's some really interesting perspectives that this shift. So we touched in the last video a, a little bit on some of the sort of ethical considerations, but uh, intellectual property, education, there's a whole bunch of different things that are going to have to adjust and shift as a result, right? So GPT-3, the reason, one of the reasons it can write code, if you ask it to, is it's ingested a whole load of open source code. Is that fair use of open source? And there's a lawsuit kind of currently rumbling on about, no, it's not, the argument is, it's not. Uh, fair use of, of that IP, but um, yeah, thoughts on what's going to change when it comes to AI and what's going to need to st start to be reconsidered in 2023 and beyond? Well, I mean, first thing, taking that licensing, mm -hmm. is what is the intellectual property effect of running through AI? You've got this funnel of human-generated ideas. Going into an AI engine that's possibly, probably going to generate something that is actually unique. So you've got the licensing concerns, you've also got who owns that from a property point mm. of view. And it's a similar argument with uh, self-driving cars. Yep. So I saw a video recently about, you know, somebody's put it in automatic park mode and it's reversed into another car. Whose fault is that actually? It's that ownership. Who owns not the AI, but the AI's output, if you like. Yeah. Um, and I don't... I've not seen, I may be, may be wrong here, but I've not seen anything in the, in the regulatory or legislative, legislative space where people are starting to give it any real thought. That's where I think the real gap is, right, Sally? Mm. Like, things that are not just generating the content, but perhaps also acting as a safe... And we touched, about, touched on this a little bit earlier today, but things that are perhaps thinking about the regulatory and safeguarding angle. I, well, I was just about to say... Um, the online safety bill we talked about last year, mm. it's only just been rediscussed and we know in the news that children are losing their lives from mm. um, consuming content yeah. that parents aren't aware of yeah. um, online. Um, you know, the regulators are always 10 years behind. Mm -hmm. I was uh, reading Jamie Dimon's shareholder letter of this year, again, to remind myself, and he said there's still dealing with the regulations from the global financial crisis of yeah. 10 years ago and we in our sector are sort of trying to understand the impact of AI well how are regulators coming to lean into that um, I know at JP Morgan we we have number of regulators knocking on our door about um, how um, AI is affecting our business decisions because the impact of um, that a global bank can have. Mm -hmm. um, and what's interesting is that perhaps the, the tech giants haven't had that, that speculation. <laughs> yeah. It's a very different space, isn't it? As a tech giant, it's all fast, you know, move quickly and break things and produce something mm. immediately. But like in the banking sector, that's where it, that's when yeah. it really becomes massively magnified. And there's right. another example. But is that right though? Just because it's about money, it's more protected than people's lives. Like, but also, the big tech are moving as fast as they possibly can, so that the regulations are always behind. Yeah. So okay, that's one. Yeah, that's one. 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 Uh, I think banks move fast, but maybe I mean. Yeah. But I mean, the, the, the other thing that's similar to that is the telco security bill yeah. has now gone yeah. through, and I, I used to work in telco. And one of the comments that I have saw on social media recently, I was having a, a discussion with someone who's still in telco, and they were saying this is forcing us maybe to move quicker than we'd be more comfortable mm -hmm. doing. Like, mm -hmm. we have a two-week window now in which to kind of roll out updates. We now have to play, play, place a lot of trust in vendors to sort of do that. But what I wanted to talk to Emma about, actually, was talking about the sort of AI and thinking about the other big trend that we sort of touched on in the last video, which is inflationary pressure and how mm -hmm. organisations can respond to that. Uh, do you think that organisations are jumping all over AI because people are inherently lazy and or they maybe see opportunities to cut costs in their operations going into sort of, you know, financial headwinds? What, what are you sort of seeing when people are talking about AI? What's the sort of reasons for, for doing it, do you think? I, I think some jump on the bandwagon. Mm -hmm. I think we are known to be slightly like sheep and we will jump off the cliff. Some, I think, are saying, 
I, I think we're going to have a change because of the economic pressures. People yeah. are having to do more with less. So mm -hmm. does that look like AI? Does it look like automation? Does it look like big data? What does it look like? What mm -hmm. does that combination look like? Mm -hmm. And I think how much is going to be, how much of the security, and I mean security of the business continuing and its competitive edge and so on, will continue with the economic climate. We have environmental pressures yeah. mixed in with what customers are expecting, employees are expecting, and so on. So I think you've got to put all that into the mix to understand why we're using AI and whether it's actually going to be taken on board and how much it's going to cost, yeah. and the ethical pressures and the regulatory pressures. So I think you've got to, the smaller startups and scale-ups will always be able to grab those things and run with them far quicker. The big organisations are always going to have that case of, this looks lovely and big and shiny and it could be brilliant, and we need it because of X, Y, and Z, but getting the business case through and then actually implementing it will be difficult. Um, when we ran the launch community years ago, I remember seeing the likes of even, you know, the business objects of that time and you know, all those different BI tools and people buy the next round because they were meant to. But upstairs in the same building had not yet actually implemented <laughs> the old one. So I think <laughs> that we've got so many different angles and factors to now look at. AI, wh where do people take it? And we're seeing some members are really yeah. taking it forward yeah. and others who are not even getting the business case through. Right. Can I ask a question? Are they when you say there's some taking it forward? Are they taking that as ex multiple experiments or deploying at scale? Because they're like completely different ball games. Yeah, and, and most are deploying in incremental experiments. Okay. More of those agile. Let's get a high performance through and get the test case through, and then say, right, we need to grow, we need to build. Very few are doing that at scale, and I think an awful lot of people are still learning, and they're almost in that comedian effect where it's evolving as it runs through anyway. So how do they keep that growing? And I think we are seeing budgets are still moving forward for investment next year, but and not, actually we're not seeing a sizable drop in any sense, even with the recession. But people are having to justify more heavily. Mm -hmm. And the use cases, both internally and of competitors and others, need to be seen to actually make those changes. But this might be a good thing and to mm. reduce waste and yes. duplication. Mm -hmm. You talked about startups. That, I mean, there was a lot of money swirling around <laughs> in the VC. Yeah. And actually, you know, maybe um, the right things will come true because they've, they're hitting, solving a customer need. There's a clear market problem. Yeah. There's not just a lot of money sloshing yes. out from quantity of easing. So, same with you from Emma, Emma. Um, we've dived straight into AI, but actually what we should do is take a step back, because I know, uh, Chief Disruptor, you're um, working on the next trends report, aren't you? We are. And so, I, what would be amazing is if, you, if you're able to, if you're able to give us a little bit of a taste of some of the things that you're seeing and the sort of early responses that you've got to trends. I don't, obviously, you want to steal your funding, because I know you're launching, is it in January? So, in January, yeah. and it's... I'm always, I'm always in awe, it's done uh, anonymously, but I'm always in awe that people share that level of information. So right. really senior members, people mm -hmm. running organisations, whether it's across strategy or innovation or tech or transformation, wherever it may be, yeah. what they share is incredible. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the kind of thing that our suppliers often say, we really want to engage and we want to help, but it's that respect and trust of those. So sure. it's, just to give you a bit of a sense, and I look at my screen just because it literally is sort of live as we go. Right. We are seeing disruption as an overwhelmingly positive thing, mm -hmm. um, even though we've all been through very, very big changes in the last couple of years, that the navigating this uncertainty that we're living in, the, all of that is a real balancing act for those leaders. Um, we're actually seeing that only 7% at the moment are going to cut down on those innovation transformational projects, which is good, um, but also that only 15% of respondents are planning to reduce spending on tech because okay. of the market. So, that, mm. and that, but flexibility and resilience are absolutely fundamental right. to their success. Okay. And those are just some of the headlines. Interesting, very interesting. How much of that resonates with you, Sally, in terms of the priorities that you're thinking about for your head? Um, well, it's slightly different because I've context switched from external product to internal mm -hmm. product, mm -hmm. um, and so our internal customer um, pays for us because I'm in the chief technology office yeah. um, very much ratifies with the value mm. we really have to sort of I mean it's going back to the basics justify there's a clear customer need we're delivering at pace uh, there's a, a clear benefit um, and it, it's being achieved in increments um, there's there's um, more focus on putting AI towards um, 
reducing operational expenditure, right. um, cost of infrastructure, mm -hmm. things like that. Like the sort of the more um, unsexier areas of business are getting that laser focus to drive down cost. Um, but I, yeah, I think it's it's business as normal, but I'm just feeling the, it, it all comes down to people's security in their jobs, and I'm just seeing the, the intensity uh, increase mm -hmm. and the pace increase to justify your role in, a, in an organization right. um, to stay relevant. Mm. So that your point around, you know, always being on and having to fit mm. in more, and I'm seeing that in order to justify that maintained spend. If that makes sense. So yeah. we're saying we're okay if actually we pack in these additional things. Right. Um, I I do think there has been um, a lot of waste and duplication where people run off and but do lots of lovely things because it's cool to throw tech at problems. <laughs> and that that hopefully is a sort of a creative disruption, the good mm. thing of like clearing out. The um, the dead wood, as it were. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, from ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's going. It's 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 going to be a time of sitting tight and steadying steadying the ship. Mm. Um, I, being an employee of a, an enormous company, we we do have the resources that many don't. And I have heard of of friends being subject to layoffs. We've obviously yeah. seen that in the news. So um, whilst we have historic. Um, unemployment I think uh, where jobs sort of hit the comfortable middle class I, th I think that that um, is a little bit worrisome I mean you've touched on one of the things that we're seeing right which is that the, the tech sector I think w ha was always going to have some kind of adjustment because it, during Covid it was the one mm. industry that went northwards when most other industries went southwards so for me, there was always going to be some form of adjustment. Mm. And so what we're probably seeing is some of that sort of seismic shift that was sort of building up mm. and building up. But, uh, but equally, I think you're right, the sort of speculative stuff, the, the, the stuff that perhaps were, wasn't a massive business case behind, that, those are the sorts of things that are perhaps being questioned. Tom, sort of coming to you, what, uh, what sort, of, sort of sense are you getting in your sort of world around the business cases, the sort of things that are flying, things that aren't? I mean, I wanted to pick up on, mm. on the flexibility mm. and resilience aspect. Um, do you, is that a result of the pandemic, do you think, that is now feeding into the way business has to happen now? I think it's everything. Okay. So I think it's everything from the pandemic to economic climate right. to the working from home through to general productivity through okay. to the efficiencies. We're seeing automation as a massive spike in terms of tech for this year the skills shortage is the mm -hmm. number one internal factor they're still struggling with so if you get the tech you've got the right people in mm -hmm. if you've got the tech already are they trained etc so I think it's it's a combination of all those things and then you add in obviously the costs that we weren't expecting from wars and <coughs> delays yeah. in supply chain I mean the reason I ask actually supply chain is, is, a, is a lead driver of that mm. I'm now hearing a lot more about resilience in a business sense rather yes. than just a technology sense. I mean, yes. you know, technology resilience, you know, did it fall over, can it come, come back mm. up again? But it's now more about business resilience. Absolutely. What will this technology give me that enables my business to survive oh, a yes. disruption? And does that come back to permacrisis, do you think? We've now kind of got to a point where actually we need, as part of our operating models, to have the ability to respond and, yes. and be resilient to whatever gets thrown at our businesses. I think that's very much, yeah. yeah. I mean, just back to your point, if it's about any of it, so, I mean, one of the Perma crises yes. in organisations is increasingly is losing technical talent. Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. Right? And it's not necessarily you've lost the guru, but it's just the fact that your team is starting to shrink. And you know, how do I keep the skill levels the same? Yeah. And people aren't getting the budgets to backfill from people yes. leaving, yeah. right? The natural it, attrition it's is that attritional a, aspect. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm seeing a trend for. Is yeah, we, unfortunately we won't, we won't be backfilling, but equally there's still that work to be done, and often it's in areas that are in high demand. Mm. So you know, it's, it's skills that are difficult to replace. Do you think the Great Resignation actually happened? Why has such a? Uh, I. Well, I, 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 I changed jobs. You changed jobs. Um, Emma, Emma's a founder of her own yeah. business. Tom hasn't changed role. So fifty percent great resolution is fifty percent true on this panel. Uh, I, yeah, I, I think 
It did. Uh, I, I think there's. I know a lot of people that took it as an opportunity to change mm. because I think. What I, and, and I'd love to connect this back to sort of sustainability mm. and environment because one of the things that I was really hopeful for during when we did these recordings in COVID and we weren't in person, we were over Zoom. Was I'm really hopeful that this is now a wake up call that we need to reconnect with what's really important, yes. like family, people, yeah. relationships, nature, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so, yeah, and, and, and so that's why I'm kind of. Responding that yeah, well, way. so I mean, it's interesting because you started off talking about the great resignation yeah. as people are moving jobs. To me, it was also a lot more about people re evaluating their yes. lifestyle. That was yeah. exactly my point, yeah. 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 And add Brexit because Brexit did cause us to lose a lot of people, mm -hmm. and therefore, those skill sets we, you know, you would say in a recession, would we have really high levels of unemployment? We actually have not got the right people or enough people. So, at what point do you then say we're going to keep paying higher and higher salaries when we are in an economic downturn? And where does culture fit in, and where does that human aspect fit in? I'll just in? jump in. It is the knowledge worker, and I appreciate we are mm -hmm. um, huge pay inflation. But how is it right that a nurse, a friend mm -hmm. of mine, worked through the pandemic in Bournemouth Hospital? Um, she now has an autoimmune disease um, from being exposed to COVID so many times. She earned more money, uh, she left um, nursing and earned more money working for the Department of Work and Pensions assessing benefit claims, sat at a laptop. She actually couldn't handle doing that because her brilliance was mm. working with people and now she's um, got a role with the council um, caring the community with the elderly. But how how is an incredibly experienced nurse um, not paid the value to, that she's providing to society? Mm. Whereas mm. we're talking about... It's, it's the thing I, I struggle with the most. I mean, I think I, I had a personal crisis uh, through COVID because I felt incredibly privileged that I was sort of isolated from the front line. And I felt mm. the you know, inequalities have kind of, unfortunately, been one of the things that have continued... You know, and again, I was hopeful that some of these things would get reset. But staying on people, education is an interesting one for me. My wife happens to be a part-time primary teacher, and so I, I kind of get exposed to some of what's going on in that world. But we, talk, we started off by talking about AI, and we touched on AI in the sort of review of last year. For me, we're now shifting to a place where it's not enough to be able to write an essay. It's not enough to be able to you know, memorise things, because machines can do all this mm. stuff far better than a human can. So my hypothesis, and I'll be interested in your views, is we need to really start focusing people on critical thinking skills, mm -hmm. on creativity, on yeah. you know, on the things that, that computers won't be so so good at doing. Uh, what are your perspectives? So I can yeah. draw a parallel with my experience in Singapore. So okay. Singapore is widely regarded in healthcare, which goes back to the nurse, yes. mm -hmm. and education as being um, a, 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 an outlier in terms of the amount of money they. You know that's spent by the state, and in terms of mm. the outcomes. So, if you look at education, um, that's true to a certain extent. But there are two things that are hidden by it. The first one is that families in Singapore, their second biggest outgoing is actually private education outside the state right. sector, okay. and that is not captured by those metrics. Hmm. The second aspect of it is is very goal orientated. So Singaporean education, and this permeates Singaporean society, and this is an important point with education. Singaporean education is very focused on outcomes, um, but it breeds a culture where everything has to have uh, an outcome. So why do I do something if I don't get a certificate at the end of it? Hmm. It's not an enrichment. It's not focused on things like creating an individual, Creating a rounded individual with, you know, we talked in the last segment mm. about balance, right? Mm. That, that there's no, there's no focus on that at all, and you can see that permeating society to a point where, when I was there, and this was a long time ago, but Singapore had to have a kindness initiative sponsored by the government mm. to teach people that maybe they should be kind to each other. <laughs> right. Wow. right, it sounds ridiculous, <laughs> but it's actually yeah. true. Right. Um, something else I wanted to bring into the educational space mm -hmm. just quickly, mm. and this ties into technology and social media. Yeah. Um, is the difficulty we're now facing in education around critical thinking, around how do I select my inf information streams and which ones do I want, and also attention spans. Yes, so if definitely. you look, if you go from, uh, you know, your Facebook, you know, let's face it, that's, that's now old. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And that is, you know, I read a page for a minute yeah. and form an opinion. 
we're now down to 10 second yeah. TikTok videos. Mm. And you know, we sit, we may sit here and go, oh, isn't it terrible? But if you think about it, there's an awful lot of education that's going along with those videos. Well, did you say anything about China? China has specifically changed TikTok for a certain, I don't know if you've heard about this. No. The China has, algorithm for TikTok is different oh, if you're China, uh, in, yes. so, yeah, yeah. Mm. so if you're a, if you're a certain age range like if you're in education yeah the TikTok algorithm will only show the younger users educational content well here's the thing we talked about AI if you think about that social media thing and you know the whole kind of role in forming an individual mm. that that takes our children are now probably being as much formed by algorithms mm. not necessarily AI mm. they're being formed by algorithms as much as they are by, say, a teacher or parental. Yeah. That's a very interesting thought. And I had this conversation yesterday with a member and his wife looks at younger people, particularly sort of 13 upwards, and the impact of social media, health. Mm. And we focus quite often, particularly on teenage girls and the impact, but actually the impact on teenage boys is equally mm. problematic. Uh, and, you know, I... I, friends who've got children who have you know, ended up really struggling with it. And I think coming back to, you know, yes, we talk about resilience and we talk about flexibility of leaders and adults and so on, but I actually think one of the most important things we're doing for our children with our children is to enable that understanding of flexibility being good mm. and resilience being good. Because I think it, to be thrown around, I think as parents we often want them to feel as safe as possible, but as long as they are physically safe, and emotionally say, can we actually get them to feel ready and creative for the future? Because the robots have come and will increasingly come. Yep. How do we make them creative and how do we yep. make them all rounded and, and, and create that flexibility? It's like there's a new entity in the family dynamic. Yes, yeah. including yeah. Alexa. Do you know what? And I have a, a daughter who will probably hate the fact I'm talking because she's now getting to the point where she's watching YouTube she videos. She So she's possible. I think it's quite cool that I have a YouTube channel actually. They, I don't know if they will when they're, when they're in the teenage <laughs> years. But, but one of the things that I'm very aware of is that she got a mobile phone. She went to secondary school this year, so she got a mobile phone. And now we are getting, having to get to that draconian part uh, of parenting where, no, the device is going to have to go away until you do the things that you need to do because it's just so addictive. These things mm. that we forget, the algorithms are designed to tap into our mm. dopamine, to tap into our brain chemistry, uh, either you know, on like, purpose or just by accident that, these, the, the, you know, that we're drawn into these, these, these things. And even as a, you know, a, a, a 40 something um, professional in air quotes, you know, I use LinkedIn a lot for my job, but it's incredibly hard not to be sort of distracted by the noise that's on there. And you know, actually I'm there for a reason. It's perhaps to connect to a former colleague, or it's to perhaps look at a new business opportunity, not there to kind of you know, get distracted by something else. But the algorithm sort of owns you. And it's, mm. uh, but what's interesting for me is in parallel with that is we do, certainly in the UK at least, seem to start to be increasing our maturity around mental health mm. and the impact of these. We are actually talking about these things now, like the, the impact of these things on our mental health. But before, I just don't think that would have even been a, like a conversation. It would have been too taboo to even, these things are now starting to become more sort of acceptable things. Yeah, I mean, just going back to that Facebook point, yeah. is this the year possible mm. prediction here that the, the talk about pendulum earlier, is the mm -hmm. pendulum starting to swing away from social media, perhaps? Probably not amongst the children's generation, right. but my oldest is 18. Okay. Um, and that generation, my perspective on this is they're very much more aware of mm -hmm. these things than maybe we give them credit for. Because they've grown up with them. Yes. They, yeah. yeah, see, they're the first mm -hmm. generation who are, you know, mm -hmm. I hate the term digital native, but mm -hmm. it is very much that. Yeah. Um, and I think they're now beginning to realise the effects it's having. And telling now, us to turn our phones off. <laughs> and they are, which is brilliant. Yeah, it's interesting though. They tell, tell us to turn their phones off, but what are they doing? How are they dealing yes. with it? Mm. But right. isn't this, I hear a lot of people say, I don't watch the news because they're checking out of, of bad mm. news. But people still have opinions and where are they getting that content yes. from? Well, I think the problem is that when, you, when I hear, I don't watch the news, what I hear is, that's a 15 minute program, and I'm used to consuming things in 30 second globs, so I can't concentrate for that long. And therefore, where are they coming from, and is it then misinformation? So, so then, it's who, nobody's curating those 30 yes. second globs, right? Absolutely. So, mm. Mm. This, makes, this makes me think you said earlier about the Queen Dollar, but it's another institution that's been attacked, like journalism. Yeah. yeah. What is a regulated institution to make sure that it's fact checked? That has been eroded. Um, 
obviously don't have a queen anymore. Yeah. And that's just another signal of like this massive change that's going on in society. And I think the British, the British culture, we always struggle with keeping our traditions alive whilst also being quite innovative. Do you think it's a British thing? I, I don't I mean, I, I've, I, I, I've spent a fair bit of time in, in, in other parts of Europe and, and worked for an American company and I, I, I feel like we do have this sort of schism between wanting to protect our past and wanting yeah, to sort true. of embrace new technology. Because I think if you look at Europe, the UK is pretty strong on digital t- talent and, and innovation um, and I think it is, this, it is creating interesting conflicts I think between what we think is normal and polite sort of society like when do I if I look at my watch are you all thinking I'm taking <laughs> yeah. the time because I'm yeah. bored of talking to you or I'm actually checking a notification you know there's all yes. these sort of norms yeah. that are yeah. being challenged you know and it's sort of facetious little silly things like that but it, it all in all walks of life these things are happening I go going to stay on sort of children for, for a moment longer you know how children now interact because during COVID they actually played computer games together and the way they socialised was actually online and they're mm-hmm. using WhatsApp as you know a primary way of having the, the nonsense that the children send to each other on but it's because it's like the utterances that you would have perhaps when you're speaking to each other face to face it's the playground stuff is now happening yeah. you know I've got to, dread to think how much traffic going over WhatsApp is complete and utter gobbledygook you know mm-hmm. nonsense but if you had homework and actually you know we all got our homework in a book and it was then put sticked in or whatever else it was um, you know uh, half the time we can't get onto the app or the login or whatever to then educate our children at home so we all sort of you know have our whatsapp group saying have you got into the login have you got into the login and actually they haven't then be educated but also they're on their screens for even longer so is there an argument to say we should be taking them off we then kill trees so so where is that happy medium yeah but I think there's an important inequality point here aren't we just assuming that every child has access to technology to learn and I, I think I remember last year I went to a conference a telecom conference and um, they were talking about you know ac- access to the mm. internet um, well mobile phones are like the new trainers aren't they when we were when we were perhaps a kid they, yeah, if someone had the Nike Air or whatever <laughs> they were the cool kids now it's like they are literally compared like my daughter's saying oh Dad, I've only got like you know the S10, which is my old phone from a few years ago. You know, and someone's got a latest iPhone. I'm like, well, great. If someone wants to waste money giving their child the latest and greatest iPhone that could get nicked or, or broken or whatever, that's up to them. But it is it is becoming. You're right. It's like this this divide. However, the counter to that, I would say, is you look at the developing world, and pretty much everyone has a mobile phone. Yeah, mobile phone. So like the mobile phone, I think, is almost the ubiquitous device. I mean, yeah, the laptop that's sat in front of me, perhaps not everyone can afford to, mm-hmm. to have, but almost everyone has the phone because it's like. It's like uh, the license to exist now is everything is pretty much for a phone, which the is it right? to our hand. But also, where do, you know, during COVID, it was so there were some real clear divides, weren't there? Yeah. Did you have internet capabilities? Did you have printers? Could you afford printers then? But a cost of living crisis on top of it now, and it is different. And certainly, I have two younger children, and they said the one thing that's really suffered during COVID was maths, because actually you're reading different languages, different subjects mm. all of the time. Yes, the right handwriting might be a bit dicey, but the reading didn't suffer so much, but the maths did. And therefore, your future coders and those kinds yeah, of skills... Yeah, it's so important. Yeah. yeah. Come through. Yeah. Do yeah. we lose that interest in maths because we lost it too early or how do we get that back to make sure those analytical brains, mm. not the robotic analytical brains, I'll, I'll really I, and this is an interesting one for me because I learned from a pretty young age because going through primary school I discovered computing and I learned from a fairly young age it didn't actually matter if I didn't know my times tables because the computer would know them for me so it didn't help my learning there and mm. so there's some basic numeracy that's not I can do some fairly advanced mathematics but there's some basic stuff that I can't mm. actually do which is a bit embarrassing mm. whoops I've just put it on film and it's mm. now going to go on the internet hey ho um, but yeah it, it, the education side of things is fascinating but let's also talk about the sort of planet and sustainable piece because that for me also feels thankfully like a trend that is increasing like I've literally spent the day speaking to financial services firms well, last week talked to financial services firms and even they are coming to me and saying Oliver we want to make our technology more sustainable more environmentally friendly which is amazing to hear um, Tom is this a consideration for Solis? Are Solis customers talking to you about what the sort of yes. impact of integration platforms is on the mm. planet? Is that a conversation that's happening? Yes. I mean, we talked earlier about cloud, mm. right? And the idea of just throwing computer problems. Is that the right way to do things? Because no. there is an environmental mm. cost to it. But I think you have to balance that against the people cost. So having, having people sitting around doing something that's not automated it's probably a greater environmental cost than 
maybe throwing a bunch of compute at it. Mm -hmm. Where is that balance? Do we have the mechanisms to, me uh, to measure that at the moment? I'm not sure that we do. Um, I don't know how that's going to be addressed. Yeah. Maybe that's going to be the next wave in the kind of ESG space. I think you're is, right. I mean, no, yeah. the research I've been doing, um, so there's going to be a separate video going out similar mm. sort of time to this, is a talk I've done on my research into sustainable technology. And it's been a fantastic, fantastic voyage of discovery into what research and data exists and what doesn't. Right. And there are massive gaps. You know, mm. So there are lots of opinions and lots of aspirations, but actually when it comes down to how do I know if this is better than that. Mm. Often it's gut feel at the moment. Like, oh, this yeah. feels like the right thing because it really consuming less. Well, how do you, it's the carbon tunnel vision graphic. I'm not sure if anyone's sort of seen this. It's just where everyone's sort of just thinking about energy oh, yeah. consumption yeah. and carbon, mm. and they're not thinking about the inequality, the other social measures that we yeah. sort of touched on throughout this recording. Uh, and so you might think you're improving one thing, but actually overall yes. you're not yeah. trending in the right direction. It's Organisations like B Corp try to do that um, entire systems approach, mm. but then it, it sort of got tarnished with a bit of greenwashing. Right. Like you just want to stick your B Corp logo yeah. on your company brand, yeah. and you think you're good. Um, and I think some some companies have chosen to delist from B Corp, right? Um, because. Uh, it wasn't actually helping them meet their objectives. And in fact, at the chief, mm. chief disruptor event, I was having a conversation, and I won't na name him to protect mm. him, but he was saying how the B Corp process, he felt he was actually exceeding some of the things, but because he wasn't giving B Corp exactly what they wanted, he yeah. wasn't ticking their mm. box, he felt he was being penalised. So it's interesting how some of these things are in danger of becoming that sort of rubber stamp and the greenwashing sort of side of things. I mean, I'm hopeful we can start to use tech and data to really drive some transparency into this space because I think otherwise it's very easy for someone to get very hand wavy and say we're better. Well, are you really? What? What? By what measure? And how do we? How do we evaluate or, that? To be really boring, have like ISO standards around what what con constitutes as an ESG mm -hmm. measure. Mm -hmm. I, I've tried to with my stocks and shares. I sort of try my little little bit of money. Yep. Um, you know, look at ESG funds, and actually, I quickly learnt that. There's no one set market metric. They they just kind of self certify yes. that this is ESG, mm. and so actually <laughs> I left my money where it was because you, you you've got to see the whole chain, the whole value chain. You've got yes. to see what are their suppliers doing, mm -hmm. as well as everything else. So we we've had a couple of sessions recently for members on this, and it came up in the CBI's annual conference as well. Right. There seem to be those customers, if you like, societies as a whole that want that change and I think COVID told us and, and showed us what it all meant. So I think there is a general desire to, to look at the planet and, and improve that. Um, but I think we've now got camps when it comes to work. I think we've got camps who are very much leading on it and need to make the change, mm -hmm. often in the tech teams and in the sustainability teams and so on, and others who very much are sort of saying, well, actually, it's not my role, so at work, I'm not going to be looking at it. And I think we've got to look at the wider picture, then, mm. haven't you? which is, what are we doing? Yes, are we switching off some lights in our buildings and so on? Or are we fundamentally looking at our business models? Yes. And are we also looking at what we then sell and deliver? And who are in our supply chain? And what is the value creation? And, and what we are seeing in a positive sense is that you can go out to your board and actually get some IT projects through at the moment because you're going out there and saying, actually, there is a business case here that shows that we are going to improve what we are doing mm -hmm. from a green sustainable mm -hmm. perspective and the IT consumption is part of that success rather than a cost. Yep. So there are some good changes but I think we're seeing different camps okay. and my fear was the economy was going to say we're going to stop it again or we're going to devalue the importance of it. Because it happened in 2008, yes. right? I mean the yeah. 2008 totally. financial crisis, I actually changed roles out of energy and climate mm. partly because the government stopped funding a lot yeah. of the um, ASG type work at that time and so the team I was working in, a lot of them got made redundant and I chose to kind of go from um, gamekeeper to poacher and go and work in the energy industry at the time. So I do fear that that could happen again. However, I think the difference now is that organisations realise that actually you build better businesses by thinking longer term. Yes. I think that penny has started to drop. I think because it's like the business impact mm. is being felt so insurance company payout for yep. fires in California yep. well it's not just fires in California now it's fires in um, in the moors in in the UK I mean there was a devastating fire um, by an individual t t having a disposable barbecue on Studland um, 
at the height of the heat wave and it uh, is apparently going to take 20 years for that habitat to recover um, and th you know this is in wet wet England um, mm -hmm. so the obviously that that's not insured loss mm. but I, I I do think there's a bit of hope whether there's financial pain it will mean that it's easier to create that business case to nice. to create the the resilient business mm. as a result of quite significant environmental threats but I think without the data and without objective yeah. measuring yes. points yeah, yeah. You know, the carbon tunnel, um, you see a lot of, I have seen, not through my work at Solos, but I have seen, if you look carefully, you see a lot of ESG initiatives, simply operational efficiencies mm. that are rebranded mm. as ESG okay. initiatives. Yep. Yeah. Right? So yeah, you may be saving fuel in, I don't know, an airliner, right, by mm. doing more efficient routing. But that's not really an ESG initiative. That's just a business operational yes. initiative. It's like claiming for stuff that you would probably have already done. That's yeah. exactly my point, yeah. right? And it, yeah. that goes back to the greenwashing yeah. thing, yeah. right? Yeah. So unless we have objective data and objective measuring points, um, it's difficult to say, A, is this really a benefit? Yeah. Uh, and B, how does this match the global picture of this whole chain? of this whole chain of whatever the value that is being delivered. Yeah. Right? And that's what's coming up with from members, is okay. it's, the, it's the monitoring. How do we monitor, how do we report, how do we hold up, um, how are we held to account by our investors, you know, and how do we get investment in, and in addition to that, how do I ensure that my customers and our suppliers are all held to account in a positive sense, so the, the monitoring and all that. There's also another point here from a technical point of view is how are we going to collect all of this? Yeah. Oh, well, I was just thinking da yeah. data is king. Da yeah. Data is king. I mean, but also data has a footprint. So, <laughs> yes. you know, you kind of, some of this stuff gets a little bit meta. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But here's the thing, right? Everybody talks about the metaverse, but metaverse is a Facebook branded in, in, in instantiation of it. Yes. So, Facebook have actually, I think they're principal value here is in the branding on it. <laughs> oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Right? Because yeah. really, what is it? It's VR. We used to call it VR. Well, going right? back to the previous point we were making, it's the social media, what's the demographic consuming that particular social media mm. platform? They're saying it businesses to... now. Wow, it's interesting, isn't it? The meeting. But, well, yeah. I'd, I'd, uh, I saw a piece that said uh, the principal value at the moment is around kind of training for professionals, like mm. uh, pilots apparently. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's quite a big use case for it, and yeah. medical professionals. And some education, isn't there, in there as in right. sort of more schooling education coming through. Okay. So we've, I suppose, um, yeah, kind of drifted onto another one, which is Metaverse. I, I don't know, I, personally, Web3 and Metaverse, there's a lot of marketing hype around mm. that stuff. The, um, my boss, uh, you can find this on another podcast recording publicly, which is, he believes Web3 is cryptocurrency's second roll of the dice. Like, so... You know, there's it's essentially another opportunity for it to prove itself. Um, so he's quite um, bearish, uh, quite cynical about Web3. Uh, I think there are bits of the technology stack that are that are useful and I think will continue to sort of you know, get interest, get investment and grow. There are other bits of it that are clearly just, you know, speculation. But what I'd like to do now is get you all to perhaps summarise for me what you think, if you were to kind of bullet point you know what? What you know, you think twenty twenty three is going to be about, and yeah, you know, this is where we'll look back at this video next year maybe and have a bit of a chuckle. But you know, if you're brave enough to kind of go out there and and sort of, you know, and yes, Emma, you're you're informed with some some perhaps a bit more data than the rest of us. But what perhaps we'll start with you. What what do you think of the sort of few things that you're looking out for in twenty twenty three? So from a tech standpoint, what we're hearing is data. Well, really, actually, change not a huge amount of change. Data. Cloud, yep. APIs, right. automation, okay. metaverse, right. quantum, hugely okay. All right. going up so okay. in the next three years. Okay. Um, so and and again the ARs and VRs and all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But I think what we've seen over the years is actually that intelligent business cannot be created unless it's the people and the processes and everything that wraps around it and the culture. And of stuff. course. So, yeah, all the good architectural yeah. things that enterprise architects and solution architects and before and so even about. Head, yeah, absolutely. And before yeah. we even head into the external factors. But I think that retention of teams isn't always going to be the highest amount they're paid. It will be culture. And the and useful work, the purpose, that sort of thing. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Sally? Um, from a product perspective, getting back to the basics, mm -hmm. focus on your users, have 10x value, You know, really um, have that clear adoption plan because um, 
you know, in a in a period of limited resources, you really, really, really need to focus on your users, and that that's product one hundred and one. But um, I don't think the product discipline, which is only ten years old, has really done a good job of it because there's many products out there that um, don't solve um, customer needs. Um, I think from a societal impact, um, I would. I would love sort of a more national conversation about what we want our NHS to be. Um, you know, do, what what is the right thing that we want a, as a as a country, um, and a increase in trust in our public services. Yeah. Um, I think trust is absolutely sacrosanct, um, and it, it has had a bit of a battering over the last few years. So, what does that mean with trust? It means meeting someone in real life, looking them in the eye and um, putting aside your differences and agreeing to come together over a common goal, whatever that is. Interesting. I'm going to pick up on something you've said there. I think 2023 is going to be the year of constraints. I think we've not had yeah. several constraints for quite some time. Okay. If you take the personal aspect of that, mm -hmm. it's interest rates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are going to be financially, financially constrained. Financially constrained. Yeah. And um, we talked about labour shortages. We're going to be labour constrained mm -hmm. too. Um, and if you talk about the business side of things, you know, businesses are going to be very much more constrained in what they can do. Um, just from geo, you know, a geopolitical point of yeah. view, mm -hmm. with you know, uh, some of the things we've mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. I think we've become unused to constraints, certainly the degree we've, mm. we've got to have. I think it's going to have a big societal, it's going to have a big business. But also because of the pandemic, we've tried to throw them off. Like in response yes. to mm. being very constrained, we've almost mm. gone and done all the things that we've, and then kind of rewinding that is going to be quite difficult. I it's think. Exactly. Yeah. But it's a totally different set of constraints, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's more, yeah. what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. It's, it's more basic set of constraints. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's going to lead, uh, as an employee, it's going to lead to a much bigger focus on efficiency. Yeah. And there's a big tension there between that and the make people values, the concepts of values. Yeah, treating and people and fairly. And exactly. Yeah. Right. How much do you sweat people versus yeah. treat them fairly is going to be. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're going to we'll perhaps get brands showing their true colours around some of this stuff, right? As things get. Very much so. We just talked about the whole greenwashing thing mm -hmm. where people were taking credit for stuff they would have yeah. done anyway. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more of that. The companies are going to become more ruthless, I think, mm. both with us as consumers and as yeah. employees. Yeah. Um, and I think we are, as people, we're naturally going to have to. So how do we balance that against trying to form communities to deal with this in a cooperative way versus that kind of selfish consumer kind of way? And I think that goes to your point about what do we want from the NHS. I mean, we talked about education. I think we need to have a... A viewpoint about that is education yes. too. We've gone from actually globally quite a well respected, mm. largely skill based yeah. education system to a more trying to hit a target yeah. yes. education system. Yes. Yes. As we you know, kind of discussed here, I think that that's potentially the wrong way to yeah. go. Mm -hmm. Are we in a position as a society when we're facing tight constraints and we have to be as efficient as possible when we can say, well, actually, we need to back off from that in our education system and we don't want to necessarily look for the most efficient on whatever metric that is education system we want one that's more focused on skills society and the, the rounding of the individual ironically as we've used more data to sort of analyze things like education yep. we've lost maybe our way and, and actually ironically mm -hmm. we need more of a gut feel and more of a creative and arty sort of side it's of difference between education and training yeah, yeah yeah and i think if we look at what happened with covid there were organisations who would compete historically who suddenly came together. There was this fabulous ecosystem and collaboration that grew and grew at rapid speed. And you know, LinkedIn would see people from different industries saying, I can help, I can help. Over weekends, people were sending messages, I need this and I need that and so on. Fabulous things that people created. And I think if with economic downturn, so often comes strain in every sense, personal, professional, and if we can try and avoid that fight or flight into how can we actually support each other within businesses, outside businesses, with our customers, with our employees, and across industry. So the this, ecosystem sort of Yeah, I think... That community... It's going to be connection. key. Yeah, okay. Rather than we're fighting survival on our yeah. own, how do we actually collectively do that together and yes. look at new ways of working and together? How do we win-win? Win, yeah. Not so, to be too gloom, but it's almost like a wartime economy. Yes. 
Well, you're right, but that's the reality that perhaps people aren't saying. We're being quite polite and not saying it because it's obviously a very difficult and delicate mm. subject to talk about. And quite frankly, we're not feeling the direct impact of it ourselves in the way that, uh, that, that, that they are in Ukraine. But the reality is it's, it's had a global shock, mm. uh, and certainly a European shock to the system uh, that we're now facing into. And the reality is our governments are sort of funding, uh, you know, financing not just that, but the, 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 so indirectly, we are yeah we do effectively have a wartime economy uh, as crass as that might sound to yes. people listening to this. But um, for me, I think uh, it's, it's, this has been as, as I expected it would be. This has been a fantastic discussion with lots of different angles. There's been sort of people. There's been a bit of tech. There's been a, you know education. There's been a big thing that we've talked about. I think you know I think what my if I was going to make some predictions, I think some stuff that we've perhaps overlooked because we've been a little, a little bit distracted by magpie syndrome. You know, I think over the last few years it's been like, oh, it's, it's Zoom, it's this, it's Metaverse, it's whatever. Actually, I think we're going to rediscover some technology basics that we're going to find a lot of value in. And some examples of that is um, the open source movement. We've had open source software for a very long time, mm -hmm. but I think um, certainly one of the things I'm seeing is people are now understanding the value of giving back to that open source community. A bit like your ecosystem mm -hmm. points now. How can we actually come together on topics where it makes sense for us to collaborate? Well, the open source movement is actually a great way of doing that, and we're doing, I'm personally doing some things on, on that front. The sustainability challenge, particularly in technology, mm -hmm. is, 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 a, is a great opportunity. There's the organisations like the Free um, Green Software Foundation, sorry, that, that, are, that are existing, so that's a tangible example of that. I think um, data, you know, getting data right is so important to so many other more sexy and exciting things you can do, but actually valuing you know, where that data lives, perhaps how it's integrated mm -hmm. with other systems, Tom, and perhaps I'll come to you on that point in a second. Um, I'm really hopeful that the sustainability piece can move on from Greenwash. COP27 was a bit mixed. Uh, you know, 1.5 uh, is a bit of a political football now. Like, my understanding is, you know, the, the low-lying island countries didn't want to sort of give up on 1.5 because by giving up on 1.5, they're effectively committing to being underwater. So that the 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 the, the Potentially losing the battle versus winning the overall fight on climate change, I think, is going to have to be, you know, thinking about mitigation to damage limitation is, you know, is, is unfortunately the shift that I think, I think we're going to be going to. The, the Western world is going to compensate the global south. Right. Um, so that was one of the things that the COP27 achieved. Yeah, yeah, which is throwing money at yeah. the problem. That's what you said earlier, why do we value the money, yeah. money part of it? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so from a tech perspective, I think there are certain things that are currently getting the headlines which are doing their own hype. There's still a lot of talk about Metaverse and Web3. AI is having another resurgence. I think there is, out of the things that are a little bit magpie, golden, shiny thing syndrome, I think AI has had a long time. Mm. It had a long AI winter. We are now starting to see real practical applications to this. It's not that you can just gung-ho go in with two feet. Mm. You do need to have one eye open on mm. where is this taking my business, what's the risk, as well as the reward and the efficiency gain. Um, so, yeah, I think there are some basic things that we're going to revisit. Uh, legacy systems, you know, are we, is 2023 going to be the year where we finally stop kicking the can down the road and start turning some stuff off? Because it just makes a lot of sense, you know? Yes, some people might scream about things not working, but let's find a way of solving that because actually taking some of these difficult decisions, yeah. switching some things off has a massive benefit for security, for sustainability, for your bottom line. So, but yeah, Tom, I well, think um, in closing, we can talk about integration. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah anyway, sorry. I'm just interested yeah. in your legacy systems there because yeah. that's part of integration, right? Yeah. Um, how does that marry up against your increasingly constrained environment? Because mm, mm. the legacy systems are there for a reason. You've because you can't, too, too expensive business case, to get, you can't get rid of yeah. You haven't got a business case. Well, that's the perception too, anyway. Yeah. Oh, the reason why it's still there mm. is because it's never stood up. Yeah. It, 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 to that, do anything with it. Let's face it. There is a reason it's still there. Yeah. However, I think energy costs may be the final push mm. that some of these systems need. If they're massive, great big, clunky things that are just, you know, occupying rooms and well, they're well, I'll come back. I've never seen an that. energy case that's actually stood up, and it comes back to the argument I mentioned earlier about people versus tech, mm. and how much is the people cost of the tech. Yeah. versus just the plain energy cost. Yeah. It's the old argument about a car and the petrol it costs to put in it. Yeah. Do you junk a 10-year-old car mm. because it's burning a lot of petrol? Well, actually, the, pe the petrol cost of building a new car is considerably more than that, right? Um, so, I mean, if, you know, kind of back to the, the integration part of you, I think we're going to see a lot more, with this constrained environment, we're going to see a lot more need for doing thoughtful integration that pulls the right data. Mm -hmm. Um, with the right bits of technology, whether that's um, 
legacy technology mm. yep. or newer technologies, I think there's going to be a lot more sweating of assets right. and technology and right. the people associated with them. Um, and that I think that is going to drive uh, a greater focus on doing not just what's sexy for the customer, but mm. what's right for the business. Mm -hmm. And probably for the customer. Well, hopefully it's right for the customer. Yeah. But in perhaps a more ruthless environment, maybe that, if that, you know, it might be right for the customer long term, but if that's meeting a short term objective, financial objective, maybe the customer loses out. Who knows? Um, quick one on integration. I think the, the big story is going to be around APIs okay. and rationalizing that API space. Which because is there's well going to be an explosion of different APIs, a exactly. bit more tactical. So, how yeah. do we build proper platforms that think about the business view of different things and have an API for services or products? Is that, is that what you're sort of uh, exactly. maturing that sort of stuff? A, a, exactly. Yeah. Um, but there's another aspect of that mm -hmm. is you know, it's the year of event-driven architectures. How do okay. we rationalise APIs versus event-driven APIs, for instance? How yeah. do we bring them into a common ecosystem? Yeah. Okay. Hoping we're going to see that next, next Let's year. Let's hope so. Mm. Yeah. Emma, finally with you, where can people get, when it's available, when can people get, where and when perhaps can people get hold of the copy of the report that you're working on at the moment? So I'm not working on it directly, which I think yeah. so I'm, I'm breathing <laughs> as we run into Christmas. It will not be in anyone's stocking, but it will be ready a month later, so the 26th right. of January is when okay. we release it. Brilliant. Um, some really interesting statistics, but I think it's also coming back to how do we individually and as organisations make our businesses work and work together is we're actually then going to get into the data and we're going to be benchmarking and comparing by sectors by size and actually working with members individually to say how can we help you but how do you collectively work together so I hope some of the challenges and those constraints we can as a group within the community and obviously beyond actually make some of those changes so 26th of Jan okay. there's a lot of a lot of work being done on keyboards as we speak and then we um then the big question was, did we go to print or not? Which comes back to the sustainable mm. point of view. Okay, very um, good. So yeah, yeah, 26, and then we okay. actually line face-to-face, -face because again, coming back to that face-to-face, -face, mm -hmm. we need to bring it face-to-face. It's not just about a report, it's about what you do with it, and how do we serve a community, and how do we help them next year collectively, yeah. and bring them together. So 26 of Jan, to face-to-face, -face and and then again in February. And perhaps another date for people's diaries, May, have you got a date specifically for so Chief Disruption? So May, May, but also we're now, what we're finding is yeah. coming back to the virtual working, t on Fridays every month, but probably now twice a month, mm -hmm. we are actually bringing members together. They don't okay. have to travel, they can be right. together, they're getting to some gritty, confidential conversations, really okay. supporting each other. So right. lots of different topics come through, AI, APIs, yeah. metaverse, but also just leading to uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So coming back to constraints, that's, this Friday actually, right. and again we're running it because it's oversubscribed, unsurprisingly. Right. Yeah, yeah. It yeah, is yeah. the year yeah. of uncertainty and constraints. Yes. Out. Quick question on the report: Is it available to members only, or right across the board? Okay. And actually, um, that's where we hope to help everyone to be able to drill in and say, okay, you were particularly interested in this. How can we help you there? What do we do? How can you take it to your board? Whether it's a supplier of capabilities, or indeed whether it's a member, because. They're equally important. Everyone needs to, mm -hmm. to help serve one another. But you make a high level PDF available for everyone. We do. Yeah. Yeah. And then they can slice and dice. Excellent. So it's well, look, um, it's been fantastic having uh, Emma, you join us, and Chief Disruptor okay. is a fantastic network, and, uh, and I look forward to continue to get involved in that next year. Thank you. And maybe we can take um, Sally and Tom on the Chief Disruptor journey, maybe as well. Um, but look, again, thank you very much all for your time. Uh, it's been a great chat. And I look forward to reflecting on what, how much of this we got right, how much we got wrong. I think, uh, as Sally said last time, it, you know, our prediction sort of unpredictable. Is, is life unpredictable now? We shall see, I guess. But with that, thanks very much for watching. Please do um, subscribe to the, the Architect Tomorrow podcast if you haven't already. Do check out Chief Disruptor. Uh, again, thanks again to Solis for hosting. Thanks for, to, to Sally from, from JP Morgan for her time in preparing for this. You were very great with your research. So, and with that, thanks everybody. Look forward to seeing you again soon.